Okay, cool. There we go. So um, excellent. Welcome. So welcome everyone to Process Counter Plans 101. Um, hopefully you're excited to be here. Um, so I always like to start out with like discussions and kind of get a, a temperature check on, um, not like you have a fever, uh, but uh, on what experience people have with the material that we're going to be talking about. Um, so what experience do you all have with process counter plans? How many of you have debated a process counter plan? Okay. What process counter plans have you all debated? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Reg -neg. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so fair amount. Did you all go for these counter plans or mostly just debate them when you were affirmative? Oh, okay. Cool. Oh, excellent. I, I, you uh, like the NEPA counter plan? Okay, explain the NEPA counter plan, Ela. Well, it's like the environmental protection mm -hmm. basically saying like they're the ones that should be, I don't really remember, honestly, it's kind of a blur. Okay, it's kind of a blur. I think uh -huh. it's like that the EPA is like better to solve because they like um, you know did, more about. Did you do an environmental impact statement? Yeah. Potentially? Yeah. 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 Like they, oh, it was the EPA should issue an environmental statement. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, I like the NEPA counter plan too. We wrote a big EIS counter plan on like an uh, energy topic many years before, many years ago. So what's the, um, uh, what else? You said ICJ? ICJ and IACHR. Okay, and how do those work? Uh, so the ICJ is the International Court of Justice, and so the kind of the ICJ counter plan is that the United States federal government sure provides an advisory opinion from the ICJ on whether or not to do the plan. Mm -hmm. And if the ICJ says yes, you do the plan. If the ICJ says no, you don't do the plan. We have both say yes and say no clients, but like, typically we go for say yes because it could also solve the plan. And the net benefit, the internal net benefit was usually like, uh, averting some kind of existential war that's caused by the ICJ sending a global signal. And then IACHR is pretty similar. It's pretty similar. Um, it, it deals with the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. And once again, the United States federal government requests an advisory opinion from the IACHR. Um, and if the IACHR says yes, um, you do the plan. Like a lot like I said previously, we go for sales a lot. And I, we could solve for some existential, I mean, some existential internal that benefit. Like for us, typically, it was like, uh, issues with the OCO and like, hmm. yeah. So the ICHR is what? Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. Okay, the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, yeah. And then, uh -huh. like there's UCF as well, which is a lot mm -hmm. Yeah, so and what was your name again? Ravi. Ravi, cool, awesome, Ravi. Were you pretty successful with the counter plan? Uh, IACHR, well, I did ICJ a lot on the criminal justice topic. Yeah. I was pretty successful. I really don't know why mm -hmm. it was. That also might have just been because people didn't know how to respond to it. Um, <laughs> what's that? It's because people did not respond. Oh, yeah, yeah. What was your, and what's your name, too? Kavid. Kavid. All right, cool. Yeah. Yeah, because people don't know how to respond to it. Yeah. And I thought ICHR was reasonably good for like topics last year that had some sort of like international spillover argument because like I feel like international spillover would be better perceived if like the other countries that like model the things the United States mm -hmm. perceive them like deferring whether or not they should do something primarily to whether or not it's good for human rights. Yes. Um, I feel like democratic and non-revisionist states would like that. Yeah, I think so this year too, um, there are gonna be lots of different process counter plans, obviously. Um, the packet, we didn't really write one, although the Department of State counter plan comes close to incorporating some like processy elements. Um, as far as like allocating budgets and things like that. I've got this like recommend counter plan from the democracy assistance topic um, that I'll kind of share. Um, and like, I guess we could put it on the Zoom a little bit. So um, y'all could hop on uh, the Zoom to um, link if you want a little bit, we'll talk about. Um, but yeah, so the strategy of process counter plans uh, typically is in a weird way to avoid debating the substance of the affirmative, right? As you all know. So with the EPA, you know, the EPA, uh, excuse me, the NEPA counter plan or the environmental impact statement counter plan last year on the water topic, um, you wouldn't have to debate whatever the specifics of the affirmative are. You just do an environmental impact statement um, and then argue that the plan would be implemented at some future date. Um, and that can create different problems for the counter plan, obviously, depending on how you write the counter plan and things like that. So I was going to give an overview of process counter plans. Um, also talking about theory, theory against process counter plans. What are the best theoretical objections to a process counter plan? How can you avoid um, I guess running into the worst um, of, you know, abuses of process counter plan, tweaking counter plan text. Um, we'll talk about functional 
and textual competition. Are you all um, familiar, at least like been exposed a little bit to textual and functional competition? Um, excellent, very good. Um, and then talking about maybe different ways that you can um, create a more competitive counter plan, um, as well as defeating process counter plans on theory and um, their various shenanigans. How many of y'all are here on an AF capacity? It's like, I hate process counter plans and they're the worst. Anyone? <laughs> no? Okay, that's great. Uh, Y'all are neg people. That's totally fine. All right, good. We'll, we'll still talk about after responses and stuff. Um, when I was a debater, so um, I did the 2AC, um, I did the 2A and also the 2N, um, both in high school and college. All in high school, I was both twos, um, which is a terrible idea mostly. But um, And uh, so I had experience with both. Um, but I definitely will say in college that process counter plans were annoying to me, although we won debates on consult NATO and things like that all the time. Um, so I went back and forth as far as theory was concerned, but um, all right, cool. So when we think about process counter plans, what method do process counter plans use to compete with the affirmative? Yeah. Okay, yeah, so you wanna explain that a little bit? What was your name again? Sophia. Sophia, great, Sophia, yeah. Mm -hmm. which is the surgency of the process counterplan Okay, yep. Okay. Okay. Yeah, similar, uh, the process of like going to organizations each time Yeah, absolutely. Very good. Yeah, very good description, Sophia. And so why does the plan or why does the affirmative have to be certain? Okay, otherwise they don't solve. Um, what else? Is there any other reason? Should. Okay, should. Yeah, you want to expand on that a little bit? Yeah. Mm. What was your name again? Carson. Carson. Um, okay, so should means immediate or certain, right? Why does should mean certain? Okay, yeah, you have a definition. No, there are definitions. Yeah, so <laughs> there's like a uh, from 1932, there's that definition everyone reads. It's like should means immediate and certain. Um, what else? Yeah, so definitionally, so should means certain. What does that mean for the affirmative? Why do they have to be certain or immediate? Because that path is like a stated point that it won't mm -hmm. take. So if the path is not certain or immediate, it makes sense that then it is. Yeah. Okay, so explore that a little bit more. So I guess you could say that when the app proposes mm -hmm. a plan, it's a question of whether the plan should or should not be implemented, mm -hmm. not if the plan would or would not be implemented. Yes. Um, yeah. So in one way, one thing, one way to think about counterplan competition, there are different ways to think about counterplan competition, but the core burden of the negative is to prove that the plan text is false. The core burden of the negative is to prove that the plan text is false. So the United States federal government should not, right, you know, X, Y, Z. Um, and the core burden of the affirmative, what's the core burden of the affirmative? Yeah, to prove the resolution is true or a good idea. So right, it's a propositional statement, it has true false um, conditions. And so when we think about the truth of the resolutional statement, so Carson said there might be a definition of the word should, right? The should has to be immediate and certain, which if that's true, we think of counter plans as opportunity costs. Have you all heard of counter plans as an opportunity cost? You know, I think they could define what an opportunity cost is. Have you all heard that before? Yeah, an opportunity mm -hmm. cost is like, um, I guess, okay, so like one example of mm -hmm. what my students would use is like, if you're on a phone call with someone and somebody else calls you, the opportunity cost of being on that phone call is you can't pick up the phone with someone. That's true, unless you like did whatever, like, you know, extra call or a conference call or something, yeah. but yeah. Okay. But yes, yeah, so you're, mm -hmm. And then when you go for the alternatives, or like you use the potential of like the original, like the thing that could have come from the, Oh, yes, exactly. Yeah. So in investment terms, there's like opportunity cost is a specific right term, which is that you forego the benefit of something um, through a path that you didn't take or through an investment that you didn't take or yeah. right something that you didn't do. So if you invest your money into Amazon stock, then you can't invest your money into Amazon. And the opportunity cost is whatever the gain right Amazon stock is, which I think it's great that investors use the term too. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But then you also have to like test out the plan that X and X thing that the counter plan solves, but then the counter plan that talks like that and so it's hard to add, mm -hmm. is better in like the context of like the world than some scenario that you're unable to solve on the app side. 
like mm -hmm. in the context of like a uniqueness kind of plan, like the withdrawal kind of plan, for example, you are probably going to say that you were unable to weigh the impacts of the affirmative because you were saying NATO is bad, but you were saying that NATO is bad is significantly more important because NATO being bad is the reason that those impacts are probably being caused in the first place. Yeah, so some counter plans present a very clear and direct opportunity cost um, with the plan and maybe have like a, a different style net benefit. Um, so if we think about like the withdraw from NATO security cooperation counter plan, right, the opportunity cost is very obvious. So the app is increased security cooperation with NATO on some area, let's say it's like an AI affirmative, right? And then the counter plan is like, nope, we should just do no security cooperation with NATO, um, right? Obviously that means you can't do the plan. So you're not gonna be doing any AI security cooperation, but there's also a whole host of other security cooperation that the, the negative, right, foregoes. And so the opportunity cost presented there is whether or not we should engage in the AI security cooperation, but also other security cooperation, right, that's associated with NATO. And then there's a competition argument associated with that. But yeah, I think um, Ravi, right? Is it Ravi? Yeah. Ravi makes an excellent point here, which is you're comparing the costs and benefits of engaging in, right, that particular action. So counter plans, and I wish I had a whiteboard here, right, they're a particular pathway. So it's like one pathway is the affirmative, and then another pathway is the counter plan. And the interesting thing about process counter plans and the reason that they compete along the lines of certainty um, and immediacy, right, um, which is what Sophia was talking about right at the very beginning of this whole discussion of counter plan competition and process counter plan competition, is when we think about the implementation of the affirmative, the implementation of the affirmative should be a straight right line pathway, essentially, that has one right starting point and one end point. So we know what the plan says and we know where the plan is going, and there's only one way that the plan could be done. Ideally, right? Um, what do you all think about that description of the app? That it has to be certain in this way, right? And there could be nothing that changes the certainty of the plan text implementation. And the app wants mm -hmm. Yeah, right, exactly. Otherwise, it's insanely difficult to be negative. Yeah, and there are some, I would say, um, just to complicate this a little bit, there are some areas where maybe the app could get away with just a little bit of, of vagary, right? So if they're like, well, you know, which agent does the plan? Is it the, you know, the Department of State or the Department of Defense? Um, can the app be a little bit, I guess, uh, vague about that? What do you all think? Okay, yeah. Kavin's okay with it. It says the United States federal government mm -hmm. for the purpose entirely of like preventing agent counterparts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and ASPA, exactly. Yeah. ASPA. It's a pass argument. So, so maybe one other way to think of the plan, there are different ways to conceptualize the plan is like a one-to-one. -one. It could be like sort of a cloud of probabilities, right? It's either the Department of State or the Department of Defense, right? Or it could be Congress, or it could be the executive branch, some other part of the executive branch, or the United States Institute of Peace. But it has to be within this certain Venn diagram, right? Again, I wish I had a whiteboard here. And then that leads to particular actions. The thing about process counter plans I think is interesting is that they mess around with right this idea of certainty and it's really just a cloud of probabilities. So it's a cloud of probabilities. You could type that in your notes if you wanted to. Um, and so process counter plans rely on creating a particular set of conditions that's very likely to result in the affirmative, but may not in the end result in the exact same plan text um, or the exact same action as the affirmative. In fact, is it in your best interest to have the, the end result be slightly different than the app or to be exactly the same? Oh, slightly different. Okay. Sophia, why slightly different? Okay. Primitive counter, counter plan can beat it. Who else was nodding their head? Yeah. Robbie. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. So in other words, if you do a counter plan that says, um, you know, we will, um, if Biden wakes up, you know, in three days and he's happy, then we'll do the plan. <laughs> but if Biden, if Biden wakes up in three days and he's unhappy, then we won't do the plan. And then you read a card that says Biden is always happy. And it's great when Biden does things when he's happy. Does that counter plan compete or not? No, why not? Okay, so the permutation. Uh, hmm. Let's say we read a different kind of plan, though. Let's, we're going to ask Japan about the plan. We're going to consult Japan. And uh, Japan always says yes to things that the United States asks them about. Oh, still perm. Okay. Huh, interesting. But, the, but it's still uncertain, or is it not uncertain? 
Does it always say yes? Oh, okay. Kavin, you agree? Maybe. Okay. Like just because your evidence doesn't mm -hmm. say always says yes doesn't mean you can't answer yes and make sure you're saying it right. But mm -hmm. also, you could read consult counterpoints back. Yeah. Oh, yes. We'll talk about theories for sure. Absolutely. Consult counterpoints could be bad. So I'm getting at there are two senses of certainty. You can type this in your notes if you want to. Two, two senses of certainty that we describe that people don't really um, think about much. There's logical certainty and empirical certainty. So logical certainty and empirical certainty. You'll probably have never encountered a debate over logical or empirical certainty. Yeah. In process counterplans. And that's okay. People tend not to get that deep into the, the description. So logical certainty, has anyone ever encountered this term in like a philosophy class or something? Logical necessity. So logical certainty is something that does not require a contradiction in order to be true. So we'll get to, we'll, we'll question whether the app is uh, logically certain. Are you all familiar with Descartes' um, cogito ergo sum? I think therefore I am. Yeah, I think therefore I am. Kabir, you nodded. What's that? Um, it's basically like Descartes like, says that like, uh, the body is not made of fact and you know, mm -hmm. Descartes is not concerned. Okay, and what was his concern, Descartes' concern? Um, I'm not really sure. It's that it like, doesn't really exist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it was basically like an existential perspective um, on whether or not he could prove ontology as existence. So like existence as a, as a precept for all philosophy. Uh, um, Descartes ultimately was like, well, the only non-contradictory statement I can come up with is I think, therefore I must exist, right? Because it would be contradictory to say, I think, but I don't exist, right? Uh, because a, um, a non-entity can't think. So when we think about the plan as a potential statement of logical certainty, are there any circumstances that the negative could win that would be true about the world that would then automatically mean the affirmative loses? So like, let me give you an example here. So let's say that the app is like, we're going to do our plan um, and it's going to be great. We're going to do security cooperation with NATO and it's going to be an AI, right? Um, we're going to set it up and it's going to be wonderful. And the NATO is like, well, that's really great. But one thing that's going to happen in like 10 years is that an asteroid is just going to smash into the earth. And so everything that you've got to set up with this AI affirmative is totally irrelevant because the earth will be obliterated in an asteroid strike. Okay, y'all with me? Um, so under the circumstances of that, does the affirmative exist, right? In you know, 11 years, is there security cooperation that's happening with NATO over artificial intelligence post this asteroid strike? No. Okay. So is the plan uh, logically certain? Will it will it persist into perpetuity, regardless of uh, various empirical facts about the world? Sophia. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. So would you vote affirmative or negative then if uh, the negative wins and asteroid strikes coming in 10 years, but that's essentially the only argument that they win. Okay, it doesn't disprove the plan's a good idea. Yeah, who else is with Sophia on this? Okay, yeah, Kavin, yeah, uh -huh. I agree, 100%. So in that sense, the plan is just a statement of empirical certainty, right? Well, we should just do it because, right, we know based on the way that the world is arranged right now, based on the empirical characteristics that surround us, that the plan would be a good idea. Okay, we're gonna get to, this is perhaps a, an affirmative perspective though on, on things. So, right, based on the way the world is arranged right now, we know the plan is a good idea. That's empirical certainty. That's what the affirmative is saying. Well, we can be sure that the Department of State does it or the Department of Defense or some other entity, right, within the federal government does it. Now, when we think about the way that the counter plan competes though, what is the question that the counter plan is asking in terms of, how certain we are. So going back to this Biden example, you all were like Biden, for sure, not competitive if we just make it whether or not Biden is happy and Biden's always happy. Um, so if we do the plan, right, which is just to just make sure that we engage in AI cooperation with NATO, and then we have this counter plan, which is like, well, if Biden wakes up in three days and he's happy, and it's best to do things when Biden is happy, then we're like, well, you know, and we know Biden will be happy in three days because we'll say it this way, it's like it's Biden's birthday. I actually don't know, it's obviously not his birthday. Um, <laughs> we're gonna do it on Biden's birthday. And everything gets done better, right? When the president is happy. Um, this is a foolish counterpoint, obviously, uh, <laughs> right? But we know with 100% certainty because every year Biden is really happy on his birthday. So everything will be smoothly implemented. Whereas the plan will create like a problem because Biden's gonna be really mad up until his birthday because he's planning this big birthday party, right? Um, I know, right? It's a great counterplan. There have been stupider counterplans, Red, let me tell you. 
<laughs> so what do you all think about the permutation then to do the counter plan if we know that the, the plan will be implemented in the counter plans world, right? Y'all think that's just, that's the way it goes? It's not competitive? All process counter plans basically compete in this way. So like the NEPA counter plan is no different, right? The EIS counter plan is no different at all. We do an environmental impact statement about the plan it goes through the process and then, right, it hopefully spits out something that's close to or just very, very similar to the plan. Mm -hmm. So how can the negative make arguments then that the app has to be some version of certainty that's more certain than empirical certainty? Oh, okay, yeah. Okay, yeah. So there's definitely something about the immediacy of the plan too. I like where your head's at. So I might pull up, let me see. I've got some, uh, uh, an example of a counter plan here um, that I might show. And we could get you all onto the, um, the Zoom if you want to, because I could do like share screen. I had ultimately wanted to just do stuff on uh, like a whiteboard. And then I just, I guess I didn't realize that this room didn't have a whiteboard. So my apologies. What's that? You can also airplay. Do you have a window? Oh, yeah, I do have a window. There yeah. should be a cable. We just Oh, let's see. Oh, there might be. Yeah, let me see. Um, I've got. Oh, yeah, we've got some. Uh, different, um, I don't know if I have an adapter though. This is an HDMI. So, is that what you were thinking? Or you want me to airdrop it to you? No, no. Like, is HDMI not connected? Um. Well, so my computer doesn't have a, a just straight up HDMI port. I have a USB C adapter, and this is a USB to USB C. Hmm. Yeah, unfortunately, my technology here. Let me have it here. I'll take a little flash mm -hmm. Let's see. Yeah, go ahead and hop on the Zoom. I'll do share screen. I think that's like our, you know, Where? that's okay. So the Zoom, let me see. Um, oh, yeah, here. Did you all find it? Yeah. Okay, cool. And I should be on the Zoom. Yeah. Where is it? Hello. <laughs> elective catalog. An elective catalog. Because I want to share this counter plan that I wrote a long time ago um, on the democracy assistance topic. And this counter plan essentially um, creates an alternative mechanism to do something like the plan. Oh yeah, you all should probably like mute yourselves and mute me and everything. Uh, sorry, I'm insane feedback, right? Uh, you can also just disconnect from audio. Oh. Uh, that's true. I wanted to record the lecture, though. Yeah, so I want this one. So you all just mute yourselves, and then it won't come through my speakers. So I guess I can just mute this, too, though. I don't need my speakers on. Sorry, we'll figure this out. There we go. Okay, that should do it. Yeah, yeah, now none of your sound's coming through, so it doesn't really matter either way. Um, excellent. So let me find this uh, counter plan here, and I'll share it with you, and we'll talk about a little bit of some of the competition arguments and some of the theory, too. So this counter plan sets up an alternative fund, which is a discretionary fund through um, the Department of State. So it's actually quite similar to a potential counter plan that could be read this year. Um, and it was on the democracy assistance topic in college, which was, I believe, 2011, um, 2012. Let me see here. <laughs> Sorry, I should have had this pulled up before. Um, but. This is an example counter plan. Oh yeah, here we go, cool. Um, okay. Okay, perfect. Um, I just found it. So it's through the Global Security Contingency Fund. So um, I'm gonna pull this up because we didn't really, we don't have a classic um, process counter plan that was written for the camp this year, although there are others consultation being one of the things that's um, most specific. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here so you all can see it. Um, my apologies that this is the best way that we're able to do it. But so this is the Global Security Contingency Fund Counter Plan. We'll use this as an example to kind of talk about um, how process counter plans work and maybe things like that. So, okay, so can everyone see the one NC? Okay, excellent. So we have the United States Congress should substantially increase the Global Contingency Funds and authorize the Department of Defense to transfer all necessary resources to the Department of State for democracy assistance projects. 
And then Congress should recommend the DOD transfer all necessary resources to the DOS to coordinate on, right? And then the plan. So whatever democracy assistance projects are being done. Um, okay. So um, let's say you can read a counter plan like this this year. The reason that this, um, I wrote this counter plan is that the DOG and the Department of State like really don't get along very well, um, especially on like democracy assistance projects. They're always fighting about stuff. And they're always fighting about budgetary resources um, and everything like that. And one of the reasons is because the Department of Defense likes to have what's known as contingency money. So right, the DOD likes to have discretionary funds that they can basically fund whatever they want to. So our argument was that the plan would cause a budgetary fight between the DOD and the Department of State because they both would fight over the resources for democracy assistance. You can make the same argument, right, with uh, security cooperation over NATO. The DOD is going to be like, hey, we want that money because we control security cooperation. The Department of State is going to be like, no, we would like the money because, you know, money's great. Our um, internal net benefit here was Iraq, uh, <laughs> which is great, right? Shows you how old it was um, because they were going to be fighting over Iraqi um, uh, transition, right? And so specifically, right, the Department of State um, and the Department of Defense needed a global security contingency fund in order to fund a bunch of activities in Iraq. And it escalated and blah, 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 blah. Um, so you can see in this file, we've got a bunch of different um, arguments and answers to different perms. What kind of permutations do you think would disprove uh, this counter plan? We're thinking about counter plans. So here's the counter plan text again. What kind of perms would you make against this counter plan if you were affirmative? What sort of theory arguments might you make as well? Okay, agent counter plan's bad um, because it uses a different agency. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say sort of. It sort of does. Um, it, it kind of empowers an agency, maybe. Um, I guess it's Congress, but what else? Other thoughts about the um, counter plan, too. I thought this was a pretty tricky counter plan. So, <laughs> yeah, Carson. Could you confirm the use of plan and recommend the Department of Defense transfer resources? Yes, you could perm do the plan and recommend right the Department of Defense um, transfer resources um, to the Department of State. Um, I guess the plan, though, if there is um, just money that's set aside then you would argue that the Department of Defense would just say no, right? Because the counter plan sets up this global security contingency fund specifically. And the GCSF. Yes, exactly. So uh, <laughs> under um, the counter plan, so one thing about this type of counter plan is you need to have a lot of different responses to the different permutations. Um, and so we had like GCSF and plan here, which as far as like the DOD didn't want to take over statutory duties of the State Department. So the way we spun the certainty of the plan was that democracy assistance was statutorily authorized for the Department of Defense, right? So the way that the plan had to be done was mandating essentially that the Department of Defense do it. So if you mandated that the Department of Defense did it, even if you gave them money, they would backlash, right? Um, and so then we had an interagency DA that the interagency process needed to be smooth. Otherwise, the Department of Defense wouldn't work with the Department of State. So yeah, a couple of cards on that. So um, anyway, and then we had like a civil military relations to set the perm, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, part of the reason I bring this up, so let's see, I had, um, what do we got? Oh yeah. So intrinsicness, do you know all about intrinsicness? What's intrinsicness? Yes. So adding something to the um, right, the, the permutation side of the plan or the counter plan. Um, I thought this was kind of funny, but I cut a couple of cards about intrinsicness being a problem from uh, like Brett Frickery wrote an article and then like Ryan Galloway too. Um, so there's some like theory cards. You don't have to read theory cards if you don't want to, but um, uh, so intrinsicness, right, as a response to process counter plans can be a pretty powerful permutation tool. So you all could um, write that down. Intrinsicness can be a pretty um, powerful permutation tool. So what are some of the process counter plans that you all are attracted to um, on the negative this year, do you think, with security cooperation? What are ones that most interest you or what do you think will be some of the more popular ones? Um, I could speculate as well too, but. Yeah, yeah, process counter plans for this year. 
I think there'll be some good consultation counter plans. I think they'll kind of make a comeback, to be honest with you. So like consult Japan, um, that will be probably pretty good. Japan's a global partner of NATO already. Um, and so we work with them. NATO kind of already does a little bit of work with Japan. Depending on the security cooperation, Japan has a lot of high tech stuff too that the US does with AI, right? And biotechnology and cybersecurity. Um, so I think that's one area, right? Kind of like consult Japan would be a decent um, counter plan. So what if we did permutation against that counter plan, permutation, um, do the plan and then consult Japan over other issues, right? Okay, yeah, it's interesting. And why? Why is that bad? What's the problem with that? Uh, because there's an infinite number of things that you have to consult Japan on. Mm -hmm. And all of those things that are, like, since the car driver one is here specific to consult Japan over mm -hmm. data factor mediation, that benefit, so the other things wouldn't solve for that benefit. Yeah, so you can make both a theory argument about the permutation, right, that an intrinsicness permutation isn't justified. And in general, with process counter plans, you're going to be wanting to say, right, like, um, uh, this is one reason I like this Galloway card. So if you look at this Galloway card, um, you all know who Ryan Galloway is? Yeah, director of Stanford. He writes like a framework card too, I think that people read sometimes, um, right? I think this is so great. I've seen these debates before and they're ugly, right? A few debates in the early nineties, the two of you read off 10 or 11, one sentence intrinsicness answers to a dis ahead. <laughs> um, we allow widespread intrinsicness, we're gonna have messy debates, right? Um, anyway, yeah, so with, with uh, process counter plans, you're always making an argument that you want to hold the line, right? Holding the line on intrinsicness responses, holding the line on plan modification, holding the line on the way that the app has to be implemented, um, et cetera. All of those things are really important. So I think I had, um, let's see, I might have had an empirical versus logical certainty um, card in here too that I wanted to show you all. Oh, no, I didn't put it in. Oh, let's find that. I have that in a different file then. Maybe I'll show that to you later. Nobody makes those arguments anyway. So, okay. So when we think about um, other permutations, one of the things about writing a process counter plan, right? Of course, to let's um, the classic argument, right? Is perm do the counter plan. So we can look through some of the answers here to perm do the counter plan that we've got in this file and then talk about other ways that you might handle perm do the counter plan. Um, so typically you wanna have definitions of resolutional terms. You all have already talked about this and are familiar with it. Um, and so in, in the way that this counter plan responds to it, right, substantial has to be definite and mandated. So that's always nice, a little substantial definition. Certain, absolute, real at the present time. From words and phrases, do you all know what words and phrases is? It's a dictionary, yes. Yeah, yeah, uh-huh. That's all right, no, you're great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's okay, yeah. It's a dictionary. It's a very special type of dictionary. Um, it's a dictionary that courts use and that courts create. So they're legal definitions of words and the way that the court defines them in various circumstances. Um, so, which is why they tend to be um, useful for especially things like process counter plans. Uh, words and phrases is a good resource. You can get them, you can get it on LexisNexis um, and uh, other places like that too. Let's see, we've got this uh, Severs immediacy argument. Yeah, the classic summer card. You all have probably seen that one, right? Um, in presenti. That means whole, governments all three branches. Oh yeah, here we go. Here was this logical certainty um, argument too. Um, this Hearst card, right? A distinction between certain um, empirical and a priori, logical and empirical certainty. So uh, this argument, um, <laughs> my debaters certainly found it confusing. Uh, <laughs> there are reasons to have somewhat confusing arguments on permutation sometimes. Yeah, you all can look at this first card and tell me what you think. If it's a uh, statement's logically certain if it's otherwise unconditionally necessary, all right? The Hearst two card? Yeah, the Hearst two card. Yeah, this one, it should be on your screen right now. <laughs> Seems to make sense. Yeah, statement's empirically certain if there's no empirical possibility of its falsity. So the counter plan, is the counter plan logically or empirically certain in terms of the way that implements the plan? Yeah, empirically. Mm -hmm. And then the plan is logically certain. And then there's this argument here, which if we collapse the distinction between logical and empirical certainty, so this basically deals with kind of like metaphysics and like um, you know existential debates. What you can't rely on, one of the things that Descartes was like trying to avoid in his whole like description of reality was you can't rely on like the facts like, oh, well, I see this table, so I must exist, right? Because that's like just empirics, like, oh, but the table could be, right? It could be part of this like a grand illusion or whatever. 
you know, this like evil demon was what Descartes was, certain, was talking about. So we need things that are logically certain. It's not contradictory, for right say. And really, they're very hard to come up with statements like that. I think therefore I am is a great example of one. Um, but if the plan represented a logically certain statement and the counter plan was empirically certain, we shouldn't collapse the distinction between those um, because otherwise, right, it can, could create a paradox. That's what this piece of evidence says. And then we got a little like paradox, uh, you know, we can't have paradoxes in debate. So, yeah. Oh, just the GCSF part? Yeah. Yeah. So just mandate that they, um, that the Department of Defense does it and then give them a global security contingency fund and authorize them. Um, yes. So we have, uh, so there are different arguments related to this, but basically the DOD doesn't want to be told what to do is like the big response. So they would choose to just do the plan. So we actually don't want the Department of Defense doing the plan or being told to do the plan. Um, and so even if we create them a security fund, that would still make the Department of Defense um, sort of mad about it. And then we argue that they would still fight for the general budget of the plan, like the Department of State would just be like, well, we would still want the plans money, which is this like budget fights argument, which is an internal dispute. And then we have a civil military relations DA too, right? That the permutation um, hurts Congress and the military's relationship. Um, which hurts, you know, kills CMR, and then there's a little impact of that. So, yeah, yeah, we had a lot of permutation work on this counter plan, but that was like, I mean, honestly, like that's the big part of the counter plan here, probably. Like the net benefits great, and we had a bunch of like turns, um, case arguments too, which was cool. A lot of solvency stuff for like DOD says yes, etc. Um, but yeah, it was like mostly perm work. Yeah, Sophia. Um, yeah, so like in a debate context, so the counter plan, um, do, you, do you get like what empirical certainty is? Yeah. Um, so I guess there was another counter plan that I wrote a while back, which I thought was an interesting one on, um, it was uh, this uh, energy topic. Um, no, no, it was actually agricultural subsidies. So on the ag topic, biofuels was one of the areas that you could, you know, get rid of the subsidy for. So we subsidize all kinds of different things. One of the things we subsidize is biofuel production, which uses like corn ethanol and like, you know, um, soybean ethanol and algae and stuff like that. Anyway, so uh, we wrote this counter plan that basically pegged the subsidy to the price of oil um, and said, well, we'll subsidize biofuels when oil prices are really low, right? In order to make them competitive with oil. So in the marketplace, right, we wanted to have a, to be competitive. But then we also had cards that like the price of oil was likely to be enduringly high for the foreseeable future. Um, and so that counter plan ultimately meant that the subsidy was going to be basically zero, probably, which is also what the AF did, right? So the AF created a zero subsidy, and then the counter plan also created a zero dollar subsidy, um, which meant that it solved. Because the whole AF was just like biofuel subsidies are bad, right? Corn ethanol is bad, it hurts the environment. We shouldn't subsidize the production of corn for various things or soybeans or what have you, right? maybe perverts markets and stuff like that. The counter plan had an argument for why it would deter OPEC from basically messing with the biofuel market strategically because OPEC would know about the presence of the counter plan. So on, in one sense, the plan, the level of like certainty that the plan has to achieve is not just, right, maybe the impact or the, the effect or the action of the plan, but also that the plan endures um, like as a legal, right? Um, and even philosophical statement of truth is what, the, is what logical certainty argues. So there can't be any way that the plan text like doesn't get implemented or doesn't happen if the affirmative is correct. Okay. Whereas the, all the negative needs to do is prove that the possibility that the plan doesn't happen is enough to warrant a negative ballot. Because that's what empirical certainty is versus logical certainty. I guess like in the Descartes sense, you'd vote against Descartes if there was just like a small chance that you could think but not exist, right? The plan has to operate at that level of certainty. Does that help clarify things? Okay. Part of the reason I bring this up is that basically all process counter plans when we think about certainty operate along these lines, um, right? And so, 
we take it for granted that there's just one type of certainty, but really there are two. Um, but some counter plans, like if they don't quite, so like what you said, sometimes you want to make modifications to the plan. Did you have a process counter plan in mind that was like, oh, well, the, the plan doesn't quite get implemented in the exact way the plan is done under the counter plan? Is there a counter plan that does that, like results in the plan basically, but not exactly the same? Yeah, the NEPA counter plan. Why? How does the NEPA counter plan work in that way? Uh huh. I think it's like, is it, yeah, is it the way it works? Is like NEPA does the environmental impact assessment and then if the assessment comes back positive, I guess. Yeah, that's it. Then, then it does the plan. Yes, then you implement the plan. Okay, I, I didn't do that. That's my interpretation. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. So when we do NEPA, here yeah, I can show you all the NEPA counter plan, and then we'll talk about theory. So um, when we think about NEPA, so let's see. NEPA is a great counter plan. I like NEPA counter plan a lot. So here we go. Um, okay, cool. Y'all see the NEPA counter plan? This is a pretty thorough file. This is like on the energy topic. So um, that was great. All right. So the um, counter plan text here, right? You know, uh, FG should initiate an environmental impact statement regarding the consequences of adopt such measure if and only if it meets the compliance requirements under the National Environmental Policy Act. Joe might have read this last year or like debated it, right, on the water policy topic. Um, it sounds like, Ela, did you debate this on water policy topic? Um, yeah, uh -huh. I think ours was like a variation where it was like, NEPA should issue a statement. Mm -hmm. like a, is that, do you, are you familiar with that? Yeah, well, yeah, so there's the environmental impact statement or environmental impact assessment. Um, okay, yeah. Yes, and it would be the EPA, but yeah, the so the national NEPA is the, um, the the piece of legislation that governs how the EPA assesses basically agency actions. Yeah. So any anytime an agency takes an action, you could NEPA stuff this year too. Um, it just would be a little weird because it's like security cooperation. Um, the one thing I will note about that is actually that the Department of Defense has an exemption from NEPA, so they typically don't have anything ever be NEPA. Um, so the counter plan could compete just because normal means for the AF would just not be to deal with NEPA, yeah. right? So um, there's definitely a counter plan out there. I'm surprised, we're not surprised, but like it's the one that could be written pretty easily. So one of the things that we um, with, right? With the water topic. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, it lines up really well. So, but I did want to bring up, so yeah, um, let's see, Kaveen was talking about this, right? That there are ways that you can have a counter plan that results in the AF, but then makes minor changes or minor modifications. So if you all look at this piece of evidence here, this Gilpin 2000 card about NEPA, um, right? The EIS's document disclosing the effects of the proposal on the environment. It explores possible alternatives to the project that might maximize the benefits while minimizing the disadvantage. Usually the project is approved subject to a range of requirements that are attached. Um, for approval. So what those typically tend to be are like environmental cleanup, um, you know, provisions or ways that the project might have to happen, um, but avoid environmental damage, right? It might like change the route of a pipeline. Um, it might require that there be certain provisions for if there's an endangered species, right, that lives in that particular area, that the project not be involved, right, with the habitat of that endangered species, stuff like that. So, yeah. Um, well, that's a great question. So does the counter plan fiat those particular things? Yeah. No, it just fiat the environmental impact. Exactly. Yeah. Is that what you're gonna say, Sophia? Yeah. So remember when we talked about process counter plans, they just set in motion, right? They set in motion a process that's very likely to result in something like the affirmative. So to make the counter plan most competitive. Part of the reason I showed you these two different counter plans is because I think they operate well as far as like being competitive counter plans. And then I guess, yeah, for the rest of the 15 minutes, we'll talk about textual and functional competition and then some theory arguments. They avoid some of the worst objections to process counter plans, which tend to be, right, that they end up fiatting the outcome of whatever process. So if you can avoid it as a process counter plan on the negative, you want to avoid fiatting the outcome of the process. 
and argue that a natural outcome, right, is just the plan. So in other words, if we went back to this, um, you know, right, like one NC, and as part of, so it does they adopt such a measure if and only if it meets the compliance requirements under the National Environmental Policy Act, right? So it's like, it has to go through the NEPA process. So the process ends up changing the outcome. Rather than if you wrote a counter plan that was like, you know, we should ask, right, the government of Japan, um, if Japan says yes, then we'll just do the plan in the same way that the app does the plan, right? Then the, neg the app is going to have different objections to it, right? Which is like, well, you do the exact same thing as the plan. You just wait a little bit. You just introduce a consultation mechanism, which is artificially competitive, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Um, yeah, we have some funny definitions in this fun NC actually, now that I look about it. Resolve to make a firm decision about, right? Should use to express obligation or duty. Okay, so let's talk about textual and functional competition. What's textual competition? What's functional competition? Who thinks they could define them? Yeah, well, come here. Competition is basically like trying to get a sense that and see like X of like a pen and pen are like doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. Therefore, like it's going to off of that. And functional competition is basically based on the idea of like what actually occurs in like the world and the kind of world of the kind of plan. That is the same thing. Okay, yeah, very good. So textual competition um, is a very simple standard. Textual competition standard is if it, the counter plan includes the entirety of the plan text, then it should not be considered competitive. So there should not be, right, the ability of the negative to include the entirety of the plan text, because otherwise you can get counter plans like consultation counter plan where the United States federal government should consult, you know, the government of Japan over whether the United States federal government should blah, 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 plan. This standard is very easy to meet in a lot of ways. I think Kavin mentioned a, a possible method earlier. You can just use a different word. What was it? Um, ought. Um, yes, exactly. Yeah. So just use the word ought, right? I know, yeah, Kabir, it's great, right? And then it's automatically textually comp, you know, competitive. That's all you do. You add the word ought. So in some ways, it's a little bit of a foolish standard, um, but people seem to like it as a way to prevent you know, process counterplans, I suppose, from proliferating wildly. Um, Functional competition is less well defined in a, in a way, or at least the definition is somewhat debatable or the impact of it's debatable, but it's perhaps a more useful um, lens for viewing competition. And this is basically like the, there's a function of the plan, right? And a function of the counter plan. And that's related to the empirical uh, implementation of, right, the mandate of the plan or the counter plan. So the plan mandates a particular thing. So what are the apps that you all are working with in your um, labs? Or what are some of the best ones or some of the ones you like or some of the cool ones or what do you got? What's that? Article 5 cybersecurity? Yeah. Oh yeah, that's a good one. So we'll extend Article 5 to include cybersecurity attacks. Um, yeah. Excellent. Yeah, very good. What other ones too? What else is being done? Oh. Okay, for cyber? Oh, okay, so like work with NATO to figure out basically where the attacks are coming from. All right, that sounds good. Um, so let's say we had uh, for Article 5 cybersecurity, um, let's say that we read a counter plan that was like, um, let's see, that we asked for a recommendation from, uh, uh, like we set up like a nonpartisan board, so a commission. You all familiar with like a commission counter plan? So we set up a commission to assess the best ways that the United States and NATO could go about defending themselves along the lines of Article 5. And as part of this commission, or not Article 5, but cybersecurity. So as part of this commission, we put, you know, some defense experts on there and people who are familiar with NATO and everything like that and asked them for their recommendation. Okay. And then we were going to implement the results of this recommendation. Um, and then let's say we had cards that said that the, you know, this, this particular commission was a big fan of Article 5, and they would recommend that we be part of, you know, Article 5 on cybersecurity to NATO. What's the function of the plan, and what's the function of that counter plan? This is a relevant question for functional competition. It's somewhat vague. Uh, the function of the plan is to be like the yeah, exactly. I think that's the most clear function, right, of the plan versus the counter plan. So 
that's how the negative wants to describe it is that the function of the plan right is to implement the article 5 cybersecurity proposal the function of the counter plan is to establish a commission that then provides various recommendations and they just would happen to recommend article 5 okay yeah you could you could say that the function of the app is actually to establish something like a process right whereby we engage with nato i think this year especially there's grounds for that because remember i think there's a difference between um in some sense fiating like a particular you know like um i think with the epa and like like wotus or whatever last year the wotus app you could just say like, here's the rule, right, on water. The function of the plan would be to establish what the rule is for when water right, can be used in various circumstances, et cetera. But yeah, this year, since we have to go through, right, a whole um, international organization, you have to go through NATO anyway, does the app truly satisfy something like a certain fiat outcome in a functional sense? Yeah, not really. So I do think there's room for the app to be like, no, we just established that we propose to NATO, right, that we do Article 5 cybersecurity, which is going to involve negotiations and it's going to involve a whole host of other things and ultimately may not, right, like the end result might not be that, right, it, you know, in, in fact, it causes Article 5 secure cybersecurity. So, so the counter plan sets up, right, a board and a commission to consult. The plan could incorporate that into its process, et cetera, et cetera. So I think, you know, there are reasons to think that functional competition and textual competition may not be as clean this year, um, but you know, both useful standards for evaluation. So, um, okay, cool. We have just a little bit of time, maybe to talk about some of the theory objections to process counter plans. And um, yeah, we went, uh, we're like, yeah, we had a lot of material here. So yeah, what are some of the theory objections to process counter plans? Carson. Um, uh, yeah, What's that? So consult counter plans bad or process counter plans bad and why specifically are they um are they bad? Um they don't they like us away from the substance of the app. Mm -hmm. And I think it's in like technical terms, but I don't want to say that, but like mm -hmm. they kind of take away app grounds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good. So basically just steals the affirmative, right? It sidesteps debate. There's not some controversy that exists about the thing that you're talking about. Um Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So I've got here's our EIS um, theory block. I can just um, go over some of the things that are useful for process counter plan theory really quickly, and then um, maybe do a, a question or two. Um, so one of the things that's very useful is if you have the ability to make something like a, a counter interpretation um, that some process counter plans are allowed and some process counter plans aren't. That's not contrived. So with the EIS counter plan on this topic, which was energy production, there were plenty of authors and the Gilpin card was really good about that we needed to have right an EIS or a NEPA process on energy production. So our counter interpretation was if uh, there are solvency advocates, then you can read you know, a condition or a process counter plan, which is pretty nice. Um, one of, are there problems with that though? What could be a potential problem? If the solvency advocate's not very good, <laughs> right? Yeah, you don't wanna get yourself involved in that, yes. Um, it could be unpredictable, yeah. So, but the member, the major app argument is that they want to be able to have research about the counter plan typically. So, the best app response to most process counter plans for theory reasons is that there are an infinite number that are unpredictable. And so, we have no way to think, we have no way to, to see what they're going to be, we have no way to predict them. And if you're saying, well, if you could find the card, we found a card. So, if you can find the card, then you should write front lines and stuff like that. So, right. Then a couple other things we test the desirability of the resolution et cetera et cetera i think it's kind of nice some people disagree i think it's kind of nice to have cards about the process of the counter plan and the uh, usefulness for education and debate and stuff like that um which for eis those cards are pretty easy to find because it's like a basically a public um a process where the public has input and so it's you know open democratic debate stuff like that um lots of ground policy analysis I think theory cards are useful if you can find theory cards about, oh, this Williams card is just generic too, which is kind of funny. So um, yeah, which is great, right? And then neg flex, stuff like that. So I think this year, um, one of the best arguments for process counter plans is going to relate to the size of the resolution and the ways that the affirmative is not constrained by the particular terms. So you all, you all could write that down if you wanted to. Um, I think that one of the best justifications for process counter plans theory this year is that it's very difficult to define artificial intelligence, cybersecurity, 
technology and biotechnology in a way that limits the topic down to a certain set of like clear affirmatives. So given that, I think there are going to be lots of fairly small affirmatives. Um, like Article 5 on cyber is like a big, awesome, cool affirmative. You probably don't need process counter plans against Article 5 on cyber. Um, but there are probably going to be a lot smaller affirmatives that are like, we should, you know, create just a cybersecurity defense through NATO to this one particular hacking mechanism that the Russians are using or something like that, right? Um, it's going to be very hard to predict. I think negatives are going to be, you know, um, caught unawares a lot of the time, and it's going to be pretty tough. So, all right, well, I guess, um, does this next one start right at 10? Are you all supposed to go right at 10? I may have gone so long. We're supposed to go at 11. Or at 11, that's what I meant. Sorry, yeah, at 11. Oh yeah, I, I could do that. Put your put anyone who wants these files, you can put I'll put it in the chat and I'll send them to you. Yeah, put your email in the chat for um that's right, yeah, yeah, the opcon file. Yeah. That's right, in airlines, which is great. So yeah. Um yeah, put your emails in the chat and I'll send uh I'll send this these two files to y'all. So mm -hmm. absolutely. Um Cool, and then it does look like, I guess, oh yeah, sorry, we were only supposed to go to 10.50 or 11, or, uh, yeah, 10.50, but the next one is a little 11, so. All right, cool, yeah, Thank you're you welcome. So mm -hmm. um, you know, I guess there'll definitely be, so like this Global Security Contingency Fund counter plan, there'll be stuff like that, where like work with the Department of Defense, um, like trying to do some non-security cooperation thing or the Department of State and then like allocate money to create like smooth transitions. I think there'll be something all of the GCSF counter plan, but yeah, like a recommend counter plan. So thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Good luck, y'all. Yes. Oh yeah, so artificially competitive, I guess the description of that tends to be that there's not some reason why it would be an opportunity cost absent the way that the negative introduces the debate, introduces the argument to the debate. So it's not a naturally competitive option to say like, um, well, either we could um, you know, implement the plan or we could talk to you know, this random entity first and then implement the plan, right? So it's an artificial distinction. Some counter plans are worse offenders than others. Um, I think, for example, this GCSF counter plan could, you know, the charge of artificial competition could be levied on it fairly clearly. But usually it means just like, if you did a bunch of research about it, the people who, who write about it, they're not going to, it's not going to be a naturally competitive option, right? Or naturally al alternative process, so. Uh, yeah, I would think so. Yeah. And like you can introduce other artificial things into the debate process. So um, I guess it's like there are all kinds of different counter plans every year that like deal with various parts, like banning all security cooperation. That's not like a competitive option with the plan to be like, well, this piece of security cooperation is bad, right? That's an artificially competitive thing. So, but cool. yeah, you're welcome. So, hey, Luke, how's it going? You're in person. Look at that. That's amazing. Oh, she's in person too? Oh, that's great. That's great news. So 